بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ڈیئر ویورز از تھرڈ ایپیسوڈ آف دا نائنٹین ٹاپک وی بیگین ڈسکسنگ دا کلیکشن آف دا قرآن ان دا لائٹ آف دا قرآن ٹو ایپیسوڈز گو اینڈ وی ہیڈ سین ہاؤ سرٹن ورسز آف سورہ قیامہ ان دا ویو آف امام حمید الدین فراہی ڈسٹنگوشڈ اسکالر آف دا سب کانٹیننٹ ٹیل اس دا اسکیم آف دا کلیکشن اینڈ ریولیشن آف دا قرآن And we had also seen how these verses of Surah Qiyamah have been interpreted by our traditional scholars. And in my personal humble opinion, I find the view of Imam Farahi to be very convincing. Uh, the view actually tells us that the Quran would be revealed in a very peaceful manner, the way it is being revealed. The Prophet should not be impatient and anxious on this piecemeal revelation. At the end of this uh, revelation, when the whole of the Quran would be revealed, the Almighty will have these Uh, installments collected in a unified whole and then not only that he will read out the Quran in its new sequence and then the Prophet would be obligated to follow this new sequence and abandon the previous one and during this time if any of the verses would require any explanation that would be, fu- uh, be furnished by the Almighty as well. Uh, so uh, if this is what the Quran has told us about its, hi- its history as I said in the previous episode that this is something of a very big nature because uh, uh, Quran in itself has delineated its scheme of collection and contrary to the very many narratives uh, which we have already s- uh, studied and critically evaluated in a number of previous episodes, uh, we find that the stance of the Quran is, uh, is entirely different in this regard, if uh, I may be allowed to say that. Now, We had stopped in, in the previous episode uh, at the point when we had concluded that if Farahi's view is correct that the Quran had been collected in, in a unified whole uh, at the end of its revelation and this unified whole was then recited out by the Prophet to his companions who then transferred it to the rest of the Ummah later on, then mm, of course there is one question that needs to be addressed, although this question is not related entirely or directly to the interpretation, but to some historical details of this interpretation. So I would like to present uh, before you some details which would tell us that how was the, was the Quran found uh, amongst Muslims when the Prophet left us uh, for his heavenly abode. So what was the shape of the Quran at the Prophet's demise is our Uh, topic or our main thrust that we will discuss today because this part has not been uh, entirely pointed out by the Quran. The Quran only tells us that the, Quran, that the uh, installments that have been revealed shall be brought together. Now, in which medium or in what shape shall they be brought about is something which we can, uh, we'll have to look up into history. So, uh, I'm now going to present before you uh, some data which tells us that how the Quran Uh, was, was found by the end of the Prophet's life. But before we do that, uh, or in order to reach that conclusion, we must also need to know how the Quran was found in the living tradition of the Muslims during the lifetime of the Prophet. So we will discuss how the Quran was read, read out, heard, listened, written, memorized, and taught. So these are some of the ways in which uh, uh, the Quran was found in the living tradition of the Muslims. And uh, we, sh- we shall see how the Prophet himself and his companions would go about reading and reciting and learning and teaching and memorizing the Quran uh, during this whole era. And this will, will lead us to the conclusion as to how the Quran existed when the Prophet died. So uh, as far as uh, the uh, Prophet's uh, re- living relationship with the Quran is concerned, which is the first thing I'd like to point out because this is how the Quran actually originated the, from the Prophet himself. He had a very vibrant relationship with the Quran. He would read the Quran, he would recite the Quran, he would hear the Quran, he would teach the Quran. And also, viewers, um, uh, we had seen in uh, the previous episode how the, he would recite the Quran or various surahs of the Quran, complete surahs of the Quran uh, in the prayers. And we had seen various narratives in which he would read various surahs uh, in the prayer. So I'm not going to repeat those narratives, but I'm going to now present some more data in this regard, which would tell us uh, about the Prophet's living relationship with the Quran. The first thing that I'd like to present here would be that the Prophet would be very diligent in listening to other people reading the Quran. And in this regard, I'd like to present before you a narrative from Imam Bukhari Sahih, and it is reported by Ibn Masood. He says that uh, 
uh, once the Prophet asked him to read out the, uh, the Quran to him. So he recited Surah Nisa and when he reached the 41st verse, the Prophet's eyes became tearful. Uh, another narrative from Imam Bukhari as Jami Sahih uh, says that uh, the Prophet praised Abu Musa al-Ashri for his melodious voice in reciting the Quran. So uh, this is, these are just a couple of examples of how the Prophet uh, would, would relish in listening to other people reciting the Quran out to him. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, bring some data before you reviewers which, uh, which tells us how the Prophet would respond uh, to the Quran when he himself would read it or when he would actually hear others read the Quran. Thus we have a narrative from uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's uh, uh, Musnad uh, which says that Abdullah ibn Umar says that while teaching them the Quran the Prophet would pass by a verse of prostration uh, he would prostrate and they would also prostrate with them. So, and he would also prostrate with him. So, whenever a verse of prostration, we know there are verses in prostration uh, found in the Quran, whenever there's a director from the Almighty or, or an incident which tells us that uh, believers prostrate before the Quran or the sun and the moon prostrate before the Quran or some number of uh, similar verses we would find that the Prophet would prostrate and this is how he would respond to these verses of uh, prostration. Then Abu Darda, this is a narrative from Ibn Majah's Sunan. So um, Ibn Dard, Abu, Darda says, uh, Abu Darda reports that they only offered prostrations at 11 places in the Quran and none among them of Asul Surahs. And these were, these, these were in Surahs Araf, Raad, Nahal, Bani Israel, Maryam, Hajj, Furqan, Naml, Sajda, Swad and a prostration in the Hawameen. So these are the Surahs in which uh, it is reported that the Prophet would, would respond by, uh, by actually offering prostrations. And then we have another narrative from Imam Bukhari al Jamil Sahih. It says that Zaid ibn Sabit says that he read Surah Najm to the Prophet and he did not offer the prostration in it. So again, this is something uh, of a description. But again, the point that I'm trying to make is that he would relish uh, being heard, uh, to listen to the Quran and he would ask his companions to read out the Quran to him. Another narrative from the Muslim Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, uh, Abu Huraira says that he offered the prostration with the Prophet in Surah in Shikaq and Surah Iqra. So uh, this is how he would resp uh, respond in this way. Then we, uh, there is another category or set of narratives in which uh, the reaction to the Quranic recital is, is depicted. The Prophet recited out the Quran both to the believers and disbelievers and the Quran itself is replete with, with words which asks uh, the Prophet to read out the Quran to his adversaries. It tells him to read out the Quran to them. And there are, uh, so, there are so many occasions in this uh, in regard that I don't even need to, need to name them because I'm, also, I'm sure all students of the Quran very well know how the Quran has asked the Prophet with, by the command of Qul, recite it out, tell them, read out. And um, at many a times this means that you should read yourself and read out what you are being told to others as well. So we have uh, a number of verses in this regard. Um, furthermore, the Quran says that true believers are those whose hearts are filled with awe at the mention of God and whose faith grows stronger as they listen to his revelations. This is Surah, uh, Surah Anfal verse 2. And when they hear his revelations, they fall down in their, uh, on their knees in tears and adoration. This is found in Surah Maryam verse 58. So the Quran also depicts the reaction of the disbelievers when they would hear the Quran. They would say that it's a tale of ancients. This is a, uh, mentioned in a number of places, for example, in Surah Anfal, verse 31, Surah Qalam, verse 16. And they would ask that a different Quran be brought down to them or, the, uh, then the, uh, or that the existing one be changed. This is also a demand that the disbelievers would make and mentioned in Surah Yunus, verse 15. Their faces would reflect anger and they would almost pounce on the believers. Another verse in uh, Surah 22, verse uh, 72, Surah Mu'minun, Surah Hajj actually, verse 72. Uh, and similarly, they would regard the Quran as sorcery and, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the allegations which they would make on the, uh, on the Quran. Of course, after listening to it, uh, they, would, they wanted to disparage it and demean it in front of their followers so that uh, they would not be impressed by it. So these are some of the examples in which we can see there was a reaction uh, when people would read out the Quran, a positive reaction on the part of the believers and a negative one on the part of the disbelievers. Again, this shows how the Quran pervaded in the society of Arabia in those days. It was being talked about, it was, being, it was discussed amongst people and people would actually make schemes so that 
uh, the, especially the disbelievers, so that if there is uh, any impact of the Quran on their followers, it is diminished. So viewers, now uh, let us uh, move on to another set of narratives uh, which I'm now going to present before you, which tell us how the Quran was taught by the Prophet and by the companions. So um, we, uh, we have narratives to the effect which, uh, for example, we have a narrative in Imam Bukhari's al jami Sahih reported by Usman ibn Affan. It says, the best among, among Muslims are those who learn and teach the Quran. We have Abdullah ibn Awfa who says, Abdullah ibn Awfa said that the Prophet urged people to adopt the book of God after him. Again, this is from um, Bukhari al jami Sahih. And then we have a narrative from Imam Muslim al jami Sahib. Ibn Abbas says that the Prophet would teach them the tashahud the way he would teach them a surah of the Quran. So not only does this depict the importance of tashahud, but also the fact that the Prophet would be very diligent in teaching the companions the surah of the Quran. Ali says that the Prophet would teach them the Quran at all times except when he was ceremonially unclean, when he was in Janaba. So this has been recorded by Imam Tirmizi in his surah. Then Abdullah ibn Umar says that once a person came to the Prophet and asked him to recite a portion of the Quran to him, the Prophet asked him to recite any three surahs from the Alif Lam Ra category. Uh, the Alif Ram Ra surahs, uh, viewers, are Surah Yunus, Surah Hud, Surah Yusuf, Surah Ibrahim, and Surah Hijr because they begin uh, with, uh, with these words, Alif Lam Ra. So the Prophet asked him to recite any three surahs from the Alif Lam Ra category. When he expressed his inability to read such long surahs, the Prophet asked him to read only three from the Hamim category. The Hawamim surahs viewers are Surah Mu'minun, uh, Surah Mu'min, Surah Hamim Sajda, Surah Zukhruf, Surah Dukhan, Surah Jasiya, and Surah Aqab. These are surahs which begin by the words Hamim. So they are called the Hawamim. So he, uh, he, the Prophet asked him to read <coughs> any three from the Hamim category. And when he again expressed his inability to read these surahs, the Prophet then asked him to read any three from the Musabbihat. And the Musabbihat surahs are viewers, uh, surahs which begin with Sabbaha, Yusabbihu, and they are Surah Hadid, Surah Hashr, Surah Saf, Surah Jumrah, and Surah Taghabun. So once again, that person expressed his inability. Later, that person was happy to learn just Surah Zilzal, a very short surah of the Quran. So again, you can see how the Prophet was very, very concerned in teaching or uh, having people learn various surahs of the Quran and how he would give relief to people who would express the inability to read or learn the longer ones. Uh, then viewers, uh, we have a narrative from the al jami sahih of Imam Bukhari. This is reported by Abdullah ibn Umar. So Abdullah ibn Umar says that he heard the Prophet say that the Quran should be learned from four people. And then those four people are named. Abdullah ibn Masood, Salim Mawla of Abu Huzaifa, Ubay ibn Qarb and Waz ibn Jabal. So these are the four people whom actually the Prophet singled out that these are uh, very exceptional uh, teachers of the Quran and so therefore if people want to learn the Quran they are the people they should go after, they should sought, they should seek. So uh, another narrative was, is uh, recorded uh, by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad. He says that Abdullah ibn Amr reports that the Prophet said that he who read the Quran in less than three days did not understand what he read. So again we find the Prophet actually emphasizing upon people to read the Quran slowly, reflecting on what the meanings are, so that it is, it is absorbed in, in, in one's soul. And again, this shows us the diligence and vigilance of the Prophet regarding the teaching of the Quran to his companions. So then there another, there's another narrative in the Musnad of Imam Ibn Hanbal, and that is, once the Prophet corrected Abdullah ibn Masood, who read, Hal Mim Muzzakir. So we know this is a verse of Surah Qamar, Surah Ibn, Ibn Masood actually read it as Hal Mim Muzdakir. And the Prophet said that it was Hal Mim Muzdakir. So instead of Hal Mim Muzdakir, it is Hal Mim Muzdakir, which is how the Prophet corrected his companions. Again, which shows that the Prophet would not only teach the Quran, but he would also listen to his companions so that if there is any error, uh, it should be corrected. So all this data again shows how the, how the teaching of the Quran uh, formed a very integral part of the Arabian society in particular, uh, in, in general and amongst Muslims in particular. So then we have another narrative from an Nisai Sunan al-Kubra and this time by none other than by the Prophet's famous companion Umar ibn al-Khattab. So Umar reports that the Prophet said that he who wants to read the Quran in the way it was recited to him should read it 
uh, the way Ibn Masood reads it. So actually he has uh, uh, actually told people that Ibn Masood is someone whose recital should be followed because of the way uh, most probably he would be reading in, in, in a very correct way and in a very correct accent. Um, uh, the Prophet sent Abu Musa and Muaz to Yemen and asked them to teach the people to uh, uh, ask them to teach the Quran to people. This has been recorded by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his Musnad. So this is again shows how the Prophet would send uh, people to various areas so that they could, they could teach the Quran uh, in those areas to the people. And then we have another one again from uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's Musnad. It says that Ubada ibn Samit reports that when a person would migrate to the Prophet, he would entrust him to one of the companions who would teach him the Quran. So the Prophet would actually consign that person to his, one of his companions and, and his primary job would be to teach the Quran to that person. Uh, then there is another narrative which says that Usman ibn <coughs> Abil As was among the delegation of the Saqif and it came to the Prophet to accept Islam. He was the youngest and the Prophet taught him the Quran. Uh, and he spent, he was the youngest and the Prophet uh, taught him the Quran and he spent time with Ubay, who taught him the Quran. Later, when the delegation returned, uh, he was made its leader by the Prophet. He would lead them in the prayer and also teach them the Quran. And this has been recorded by Ibn Sa'd in his Tabqat al-Kubra. So this again shows how the Prophet uh, would rely and especially encourage the younger generation in this regard. We have another narrative from uh, Ibn Sa'd's at uh, al-Kubra. Farwa ibn Musayk ibn al-Haris would often attend the gatherings of the Prophet and learn the Quran and obligations and injunctions of Islam. So this is again another example of how people would be enthusiastic in learning the Quran. Then we have another narrative again from uh, Ibn Sa'd's Tabaqat al-Kubra. The Prophet left behind Maaz ibn Jabal in Mecca when he left for the campaign of Hunayn so that Maaz would teach them the Quran. So he specially left behind Maaz ibn Jabal, a very famous reciter of the Quran, a very brilliant teacher of the Quran. Uh, even uh, in instances when he had to go out for a battle, the Prophet would uh, be very careful and very sensitive to the needs of the people in learning the Quran. He left one of his famous, famous teachers in the Battle of Hunan in, in Medina, uh, in Mecca, uh, so that uh, uh, he, he could teach people the Quran and there should be not be any gap in this teaching. In Medina, this again has been recorded by uh, Ibn Sa'd in his At-Tabaqat al-Kubra. So in Medina, the house of Makhrama ibn Naufal was called the house of Quran memorizers. It was called the Dar al-Qurra. It was here that Ibn, uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn uh, Umm Maktoum, the blind, resided. So this, this was especially a place of the, uh, of the memorizers of the Qur'an. Uh, it was called Dar al-Qurra. And here, of course, we can see that it was, uh, would be a place where the reciters or the, or the memorizers of the Qur'an would reside or gather uh, to discuss or mutually uh, revise the Qur'an. And then we have uh, Ibn Hajar in his uh, Al-Isaba pointing out the fact that according to Al-Waqidi, the Prophet entrusted Wardan, an ancestor of Al-Furat ibn Yazid, to Sayyid ibn Aban ibn Al-As so that he could teach him the Qur'an. It is evident from a report by Abu Sayyid al-Khudri that the companion would sit around a person who would read out the Qur'an to them. In one such instance, the Prophet came over to such a gathering and praised them for this noble act. So we can see how the, the companions would sit around a person who would read out the Quran to them. And when the Prophet came to know of such a gathering, he was very pleased to see how the, how the, how the Sahaba, or the companions were discussing and revising the Quran. This has been mentioned by Abu Dawud in his Sunan. Amongst the members of the delegation from the Banu Hunifa who came to the Prophet to embrace Islam was Rahal ibn uh, Anfawa, who, to whom Ubay ibn Qab would teach the Quran. Again, uh, recorded by Ibn Sa'd and Tabqat al-Kubra. And then we have Abdullah ibn Auf al-Ashhaj uh, was a member of the delegation of, Rabi, uh, of Rabia Abdul Qais, which came over to the Prophet after the conquest of Mecca to embrace Islam. It is recorded by Ibn Sa'd that he would ask questions from the Prophet about the Quran. Again, which shows us that primarily it was the Quran that would form the basis of uh, conversion and people would ask questions about uh, the Quran from the Prophet. This has also been recorded by Ibn Sa'd in his at And when we have, an, when Abu Harab ibn Khawalid 
uh, Ibn Amir ibn Uqail came to the Prophet, he recited the Quran before him and presented Islam to him. Again, see, it tells us how the Prophet would uh, take lead in actually presenting uh, the Quran uh, before people who would like to know about Islam. This has also been recorded by uh, Ibn Sa'ad in the Tabqat al-Qubra. The Prophet once recited out the Quran to a Christian delegation that came from Najran, again recorded by Ibn Sa'ad. So this is how the Prophet would actually present the message of Islam. In the 10th year of Hijrah, 15 people from our uh, Rahaviyin, a sub-tribe of the Mudahij tribe, came over to the Prophet. They embraced Islam and learned the Quran, again recorded by Ibn Sa'ad. When the tribes of Adl and Al-Qara and Al embraced Islam, the Prophet sent six of his companions to inculcate in them a deep understanding of religion and to teach them the Quran. Again, this has been recorded by Ibn Abdul Bar in his Al-Asti'ab. So this is how we see the Prophet sending teachers and in fact we can see six of them, of them being sent because when the tribes uh, would embrace Islam, they would need more people to teach them the Quran. In the 10th year of Hijrah, when a delegation of Banu Haris uh, in Najran came over to the Prophet and embraced Islam, the Prophet sent Amr ibn Hazm anhu, with them to teach them the Quran, recorded by a Tabari in his tariq. So this is how the Prophet would send a person, or in this particular case, send a person uh, so that he could teach them the Quran. Then we have Ibn Abdul Bar in his al istiyab recording the fact that the Prophet sent Maaz, Maaz ibn Jabal as a judge to one area of Yemen to teach them the Quran and the directives of Islam. Abu Rafa' al adhabi learned the whole of Surah Baqarah from the Prophet. This is recorded by Ibn Abi Shayba. Then we have Abdullah ibn Abbas saying that he had learned the Muhkam surahs of the Quran in the time of the Prophet. Again recorded by uh, Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musannaf. At the behest of the Prophet, Abdullah ibn Masood taught whatever Quran he knew to Mu'az. Both would often go to the Prophet before, before whom Mu'az would recite the Quran. And Mu'az was one of the teachers of the Quran in the times of the Prophet. So at the behest of the Prophet, Abdullah ibn Masood taught whatever Quran he knew to Mu'az. So Mu'az would be taught the Quran by Abdullah ibn Masood and both of them would go to the Prophet before whom Maaz would actually recite what the, the Quran that he had learned from Abdullah ibn Masood. This has been recorded by uh, Ibn Abi Shaiba in his Musannaf. Now, before migration, the Prophet sent Musab ibn Umar and Ibn, and ibn Umm Maktoum to teach the Quran to the people of Medina. Again, before migration, he had sent two of his very famous reciters and memorizers of the Quran who, would go, who, who went to, to Medina before the Prophet himself went so that the Quran could be taught. Uh, to those people in, in Medina, and this has been recorded by Ibn Sa'ad in his uh, Tabaqat al Kubra. And then we have the Prophet once read the Quran before Abu Bakr, who embraced Islam. So, this is uh, Ibn Ishaq in his Asira Nabawiya actually telling us the story of how Abu Bakr himself embraced Islam. It was because the Prophet had read out the Quran to him. And then we have uh, Ibn Ishaq also recording in his Asira Nabawiya that the Prophet presented Islam and read out the Quran before az Zubair ibn al awwam Usman ibn Affan, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. He read the Quran to all of them. We previously, I just read out a report which tells us that he read the Quran before Abu Bakr. So all of them, when they heard the Quran, they accepted Islam. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Haris, Abu Salama ibn al-Asad, uh, Abdullah ibn al-Arqam, and Usman ibn uh, Maz'oon visited the Prophet. Uh, he presented bef Islam before them and read out the Quran to them. At this, they embraced Islam. So we see how uh, people uh, embraced Islam at the hands of the Prophet simply when they heard him reading the Quran and how powerful the Quran's message must have been. And we have the Prophet recited the Quran before a delegation of Christians which had come over from Ethiopia, as a result of which all of them embraced Islam. Again, recorded by Ibn Ishaq in his Sira Nabawiya. The first person to openly communicate the Quran in Mecca from the mouth of the Prophet was Abdullah ibn Masood, again recorded by uh, Ibn Ishaq in his Asira Nabawiya. We have Khabab ibn al Arth uh, uh, saying that, uh, that uh, uh, Ibn Ishaq saying that Khabab ibn al Arth taught the Quran to Umar's sister Fatima and to her husband Sayyid ibn Zayd. Abu Walid Utbah ibn Rabia once came over to the Prophet and offered him various things in return for giving, giving up his mission. The Prophet responded by reciting the initial verses of Surah Hami Mustajza. So instead of responding to him in any other way, the Prophet actually just read out the verses, some verses of 
Surah Hamim was such that this has been recorded by Ibn Ishaq in his uh, Seerah an Nabviya. Then we have Ayas ibn Mu'az, uh, ex- uh, uh, Ibn Ishaq saying that Ayas uh, ibn Mu'az accepted Islam at the hands of the Prophet when he read out the Quran to him. This has been recorded by actually Ibn Hisham, not Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Hisham is a Seerah an Nabviya. The students of the companions too taught the Quran. It is narrated that amongst Ibn Masood's companions who taught the Quran were Al Kama, Al Aswad, Abida, Masruq, Amr ibn Shrahbil, and Haris ibn Qais. So these are the, the companions uh, or the students of the companions who themselves would teach the Quran, and this has been recorded by Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musannaf. And another narrative from Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musannaf says that Abu Abdul Rahman al Sulami uh, taught the Quran for 40 years. We all know that uh, he was a famous. A student uh, or he was a famous Tabi and he uh, actually taught the Quran in, in, the, uh, in a mosque in Kufa for 40 years. So viewers, this is how this is a, a, a small glimpse of how the Quran was being taught in the Arab society not only by the Prophet but by uh, his companions as well. And now I'm going to present some more data which shows us how people uh, were uh, very diligent in memorizing the Quran. And we, although we know that people have taken up the task of counting how many memorizers were there uh, in the times of the Prophet, but obviously this is a task which uh, one can say from, its, from one's own common sense that it cannot be, uh, one can never count, one can never have a record of the number of people who actually had learned the Quran. A rough estimates uh, can be made, but neither has history reported all the memorizers, nor can a person enlist all these memorizers. He can only enlist those memorizers which came to his notice or to his knowledge. So uh, we know that uh, there, w- there were several memorizers of the Quran and uh, this we shall also take up when we uh, discuss the next cha- in the next um, topic how the Quran was actually uh, taken by the companions, learned by the companions and then transferred to the next generation. But mm, the obvious incentive for learning the Quran was there uh, and the Prophet encouraged his companions and uh, and uh, his uh, other followers to learn the Quran and transmit it. So we have a special category of people called the Hufaz or the Qurra who were repositories of the complete Quran and the Prophet actually, uh, we know that there are, there are a number of narratives which actually uh, give incentives of great reward in the hereafter and of course this would have encouraged and uh, um, given impetus to the memorization of the Quran. So Abdullah bin Umar reports that he heard the Prophet say, one can be envious of two persons only, a person who has been bestowed the Quran by the Almighty and he reads it at night and a person who has been blessed with wealth by the Almighty and he spends it in the way of Allah morning and evening. Again, this is, someone, this is a coveted thing that someone who is, has learned the Quran. The more a person had the Quran committed to memory, the more he was deemed desirable to lead Muslims in the prayer. Of course, this is a fact. So Abu Masood al-Ansari reports that the Prophet said, People who know the book of God more should be made imams. This has been recorded by Imam Muslim in his Jami al So to be appointed a prayer leader was something of a very coveted nature. And this would only be uh, enjoyed by those persons or disposition would be held by those persons who knew more of the Quran. The Prophet told his, memori- uh, his companions that a memorizer needs to constantly revise the text for a lapse in this regard would make him forget the Quran. Abdullah uh, r- reports from the Prophet, Keep revising the Quran for it will vanish from your heart sooner than a camel which is set loose. So this has been uh, recorded by Imam Muslim in his Jami Sahih. Aisha reports as a prophet, uh, reported a person who is fluent in reading the Quran will be, n- uh, will be with noble and honor- honorable scribes and he who reads the Quran with difficulty will receive a double reward. And this has been recorded by, Ibn, uh, by Abu Dawud in his Sunan. Bara ibn Azib reports that the prophet would ask, uh, the, the Prophet asked Muslims to decorate the Quran with their voices. And this has been recorded again by Abu Dawud in his Sunan. Uh, and then we have uh, Abu, Abu Sa'ar at uh, tamimi uh, he, he said that I, heard, I had memorized the Quran, uh, in, I had memorized the Quran in the time of the Prophet. This has been recorded by Umar ibn Shabba in his al akbar al madina uh, now, viewers, I can present more narratives in this regard as well, but uh, I shall leave it uh, so that uh, to, to just to present a few samples before you was my purpose in telling or communicating to you how the Quran was memorized and cherished uh, by, uh, by the companions because the Prophet himself gave this incentive of how high a position uh, memorizer of the Quran would, he, would hold uh, in the day of, on the Day of Judgment. So this actually 
uh, made many people take up the task of, of learning the Quran. And needless to say, the Quran itself has such rhythm and beat that uh, memorizing the Quran itself has, is, is a very easy task if a person uh, goes about it. And this, this uh, structure and construction and this rhythm of the Quran has contributed a lot in people uh, memorizing the Quran in a very short time. So now, viewers, I'm going to take up another topic or another section which tells us how the Quran, besides being memorized, was also consigned to, to in, in the form of a written document. So that we find uh, writing the Quran uh, as something which is also which is also present in the times of the Prophet. So the Quran already, uh, we know, uh, had uh, had made this distinction while telling uh, about itself that. Uh, it was something which was taught by the qalam or by the pen. So we have Surah Iqra in which the verses are Iqra wa rabbuk al-akram allazi allama bil qalam. Read out to them and the fact is that your Lord is the most bounteous who taught this Quran by the pen actually. And the context tells us that uh, what, what we are, the, the Iqra, the word is the Surah, surah Iqra, Iqra bismi rabbik allazi khalaq actually refers to the fact that uh, the Prophet is being told to read out the Quran before people uh, in the name of his Lord and uh, he, and the, the fact is that uh, the Quran has been taught by the Khalam, Allama bil Khalam, which tells us that it was written. Of course, uh, we, we find uh, it being referred to by a number of verses as a written document when, for example, the disbelievers would say, وَقَالُوا أَسَاتِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ اِكْتَتَبَهَا فَهِيَا تُمْلَ عَلَيْهِ بُكْرَةً وَأَسِيلًا and they say fables of the ancients he had he has had written they are written and taught to him morning and evening uh, narratives uh, show that the prophet would call for his companions when a revelation would come down to him and uh, similarly we we find that uh, there are he would actually uh, call people who would uh, live near his house specifically or even uh, not, if they are not near about uh, he would call them so that uh, revelations could be written down. Now, uh, viewers, uh, before I give some examples in this regard, let me also present before you the fact that uh, people, our historians have gone about uh, recording the number of uh, scribes of revelation as well. And thus, for example, Yaqubi in his history has given a whole list of uh, scribes. And then we have Dr. Ramyar. Uh, saying that there exists a difference of opinion in the number of scribes of revelation. Ibn Asakir in his Tariq Medina at the Mashq mentions 23, while Abu Shamma summarizing uh, the, uh, the, this book lists 25. Ibn Abdul Bar in his Al Istiyab mentions 25. And uh, we have uh, Zanjani who mentions 43. And uh, this is a summary which has actually been made by Dr. Mahmoud Ramiyar. And the most recent edition in this regard is uh, Muhammad Mustafa Azmi's book, who has actually uh, written a book called Kuttab nabi which means the scribes of the Prophet. Of course, uh, this means that uh, it's not just the scribes who had written the Quran. He has made a general list of these, as these scribes. Uh, viewers can look up these, uh, these uh, manuals and these books. But the fact is that in this regard, it may be uh, noted that uh, these uh, scribes, none of them were officially appointed by the Prophet as a scribe. He would just r r ask them to, to write down the, down the Quran as if he would ask, as if a teacher would ask a student to come over and take dictation from him. So uh, I shall presently say something more about it. But for the moment, let me just present before you some narratives which tell us how that, uh, how the Prophet would uh, uh, make this arrangement of asking people to come over and then uh, write down the Quran and even have uh, he would even hear out what ha they had written so that any correction could be made. So let me present before you a narrative from Imam Bukhari al Jami al Sahih, and uh, this has been reported by Bara uh, Bara ibn Azib. So he says, "An Bara qal lama nazalat la yastawil qaiduna mil mu'minina wal mujahiduna fi sabilillah qal al Nabi udruli zaidan wal yaji bil lauh wal dawat wal katif." أَوِ الْكَتِفَ وَالدَّوَاتِ ثُمَّ قَالْ اُكْتُبْ لَا يَسْتَوِ الْقَاعِدُونَ وَخَلْفَ زَهْرِ النَّبِيَ عَمْرُ بْنُ بُلْأُمِّ مَكْتُومِ الْأَعْمَى قَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ فَمَا تَأْمُرُنِي فَإِنِّي رَجُلٌ زَرِيرٌ زَرِيرُ الْبَصْرِ فَنَزَلَتْ مَكَانَهَا لَا يَسْتَوِ الْقَاعِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ غَيْرُ أُولِ الدَّرَرِ سو براس says when the worst those among the believers who sat and did not go for jihad and those who fought in the way of God are not equal was revealed. The Prophet said, call for Zaid. So this is, the, the, this, is, this is how 
So he would ask uh, his companions to come forth and, re and write down uh, what had been revealed. So the Prophet said, call for Zed and let him bring tablets and shoulder bones in the ink pot or, sh or shoulder bones in the ink pot. He then said, Zed, write down. Again, the same verse. Standing right behind the Prophet's back was Amr ibn Abd Umm Maktoum, the blind. He said, O Prophet, was, what is your directive about me? For I am a blind. At this, the following verse was revealed, actually. Uh, some, uh, some more words which says, Well, Mujahiduna, La yasta vil qaiduna mil mu'mina fi sabilillahi wal mujahiduna. Which means that those among the believers who are not handicapped and who sat and did not go for jihad and those who fought in the way of God are not equal. Again, a question asked by uh, Ibn Ibn Maktoum and being answered here. This has been recorded viewers in the uh, in, in Jamia Sahih of Imam Bukhari. And then uh, similarly viewers, we have another narrative from uh, which is recorded by At-Tabrani and Mojim kabir uh, it says that Zaid ibn Sabit said, uh, actually first, let me just read out the, uh, the Arabic. So it has, it is reported, and Zaid ibn Sabit qal, kuntu aktubul wahya li Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa kana iza nazala alayhi akhazat hu biruhain shadida, wa arikan arkan, shadidan, misl al-juman, misl al-juman, summa surya anhu, fa kuntu adkhalu alayhi biqitahi, بِقِطْعَةِ الْكَتَبِ أَوْ كِسْرَةٍ فَأَقْتُبْ وَهُوَ يُمْلِي عَلَيَّ فَمَا أَفْرَغُ حَتَّى تَكَادُ رِجْلَيَّ تَنْكَسِرُ مِنْ مِنْ سِقْلِ الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ سِقْلِ الْقُرْآنِ حَتَّى أَخُولَ لَا أَمْشِي عَلَى رِجْلَيَّ أَبَدًا فَإِذَا فَرَغْتُ قَالْ اِقْرَأْهُ فَإِنْ كَانَ فِيهِ سَكْتٌ أَكَامَهُ uh, Zaid ibn, uh, ibn Sabit said, uh, actually the words are, Summa akhraju bihi ilan nas. Uh, Zaid ibn Sabit said, I used to write down the revelations in the presence of the Messenger of God. When a revelation would descend, he would be in great distress and would profusely sweat as if pearls were scattered. Then when the revelations would end, I would come over to him with a piece of, uh, with a portion of saddlewood. Then I would write and he would dictate to me. As soon as this would finish, I would feel that my legs were going to break with the weight of the Quran and I would say to myself that I would never be able to walk on my legs. When I would finish, he or the messenger would say, read it out to me. Then if there would be any mistake, he would correct it and then I would take it to people. So this shows how the Prophet was not only very uh, concerned in having the Quran written, but he would hear out what was written so that if in case of any error, uh, it could be corrected. And this of course shows how he was, uh, how he, how diligent he was or how sensitive he was that there should not be any mistake in what had been written. We also find viewers, uh, uh, the companions writing the Quran uh, in the presence of the Prophet. Thus we have a narrative uh, in, uh, Imam, uh, in Imam Baqiya Sunan uh, which says, uh, Kunna, uh, it is reported by Zaid ibn Sabit, it says, uh, and Zaid ibn Sabit رضي الله عنه قال كنا حول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نؤلف القرآن. So Zaid ibn Sabit said we would compile the Quran in the presence of the Prophet. We would compile the Quran in the presence of the Prophet, and this narrative views as actually from the Mustadrak of uh, Al Hakim. And then we see how the companions themselves would copy out the Quran. Again, this is a detail that I'd like to present before you and found in uh, al baqis the Surah Al-Kubra. Uh, it says uh, and recorded by uh, Ibn Abbas that An Ibn Abbas qal kanat al-masayif la tuba' kan al-rajul ya'ti bi warakhatin inda al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa yakumu al-rajul fa yahtasibu fa yaktubu summa yakumu akhar fa yaktubu hatta yufragu mid al-mushaf. Ibn Abbas said masayif in, in, his, in this time were not sold. So they were not sold, they were written down. A person would come with his pages in the presence of the Prophet. Another person would stand up and write on his pages without charging him. Then another would stand up and write and this continued till the Musaf had been written. This shows how viewers, uh, the Prophet uh, or the companions were diligent in copying out the Quran and making their own copies for themselves uh, so that uh, it could be read. Thus, you, viewers, we can see that uh, fr from this data, 
I can present even uh, some more data in this regard, but I'll content myself to the, the one uh, to the to what I have presented uh, in order to give you some idea of how uh, the Quran was actually read read out, heard, written, memorized, and taught in the living tradition of the Muslims in accordance with the, uh, with with the responsibility. We know that the Prophet was told by the by the Almighty, Utluma wahiya ilayka min al-kitab. They recite out uh, what is revealed to you from the Book of God. And then we have, Ya ayyuh rasul ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Which means that uh, it is essential uh, that the Prophet must communicate whatever has been revealed to him by his Lord. So this was basically yours, uh, an overview of how the Quran existed in the living tradition of the Muslims. And from here, viewers, we can make a... Uh, deduction of the fact that if we want to find out how the Quran existed in the times of the Prophet then we can say that it existed in the living tradition of the Muslims in two mediums it was found in the memories of people and it was found uh, in written form as well um, however viewers uh, what, 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 what one can uh, exactly surmise is the fact that uh, the Prophet did not leave behind any official record of revelations whether in the form of scattered uh, revelations or in the form of a unified book. He never did that. This is absolutely evident. Uh, this is clear. And, uh, and he also did not single out any official uh, repository of the Quran in the form of a companion telling us that this is a person from whom you can precisely take the Quran, which I leave behind. No, he never did that. So he did not leave any officially compiled mushaf or codex behind him. He actually had transferred the Quran that he acquired from Gabriel to the living tradition of the Muslims. He had it uh, written down uh, to his companions. He had it dictated to his companions and he had it, he taught it to his uh, companions and he also asked them uh, to memorize it and to, to read it and to teach it. So it was found in the living tradition of the Muslims. And it is not uh, proper, as some people have claimed, that he actually had uh, the Quran written down in the form of a book. We have we find, for example, people like Imam Khui and uh, even Tamanna Imadi telling us that the word kitab, uh, which has been used by the Quran uh, in a number of places for itself, t tells us that it must be in the form of a written book. I am afraid this is against usage. Uh, the, the, word, the word al kitab can be linguistically spoken for a, for a written book for a book which is found in the memory, for a book which is found in a computer, for a book which is found in any virtual medium, for example, in, in, in a PDF or a Kindle or, a, or on the internet. So these, this is how a book can be called. It is not necessary that a book has to be there in printed form or written form before us to be called a book. A book can exist in one's memory. It can exist in any medium as long as uh, it refers to a unified whole. So I would not go along by, uh, by them as well. And we also know, viewers, that there are some scholars uh, uh, like, for example, and I would point out some classical scholars in this regard, like Al-Khattabi and Al-Zarkashi, who say that the Quran had not been written down in the form of a book uh, for some reasons. And they give out those reasons. And one of the reasons is that uh, there was a chance that revelation would come right till the Prophet's own death. So he never got the chance to. Uh, have it assembled in the form of a book, and this is the this is a pretext that they present, uh, both uh, Imam Khattabi and Zarkashi, that since there was a chance that the revelation would uh, could come till right up to his death, I would uh, my personal take in this regard is that perhaps this too is uh, uh, stretching too far, because there are at least two clear incidents in the life of the Prophet which tell us that the Quran was complete. Uh, well before his death and had he wanted to compile it in the form of a codex or a written musaf, he had ample chance to do, to do so but he never did so. Thus we know that uh, in the last Ramadan of his life when he had revised the Quran with Gabriel twice uh, signifying the fact or in all probability that the Quran had been completed we know that that happened in the last Ramadan and he lived for five more months after that but he never initiated a task of compiling in the form of a book. Similarly, we know in the last Hajj, after which again he lived for uh, three months, he had actually said that he was leaving down the book, he was leaving behind the book of God to his people and the words are that if they adhere to it, lan tadillu abada, they would never go astray, which again tell us that he was, had, was leaving behind him the complete Quran and if they held on to it, if they were, if they adopted it in their lives, they would not go astray and he again lived after the last sermon for three months. So these two incidents, to my mind, tell us that the Quran was complete well before his death 
and had the prophet actually intended to compile it in the form of a book or a codex, he had enough time to do so or at least he could have initiated the task but he never did so. So I think it was intentional and in this regard the methodology that he adopted was that instead of compiling a single codex and uh, of course this could, this could have created a lot of problems as well and uh, the major problem of course would be that the in those times a writing was uh, was dependent on the oral tradition. So even if he had written a codex, he would have he would have needed someone orally to read the written codex because we know that di diacritical marks were uh, sparingly used, and uh, uh, it, it for any written text, especially like the Quran, a memorizer was was a must uh, who would actually read the Quran properly. So there could have been other reasons as well, but I, I am pretty sure that the, uh, the Quran, the way the Prophet communicated it to his uh, to the rest of the Ummah was that he actually had people write it down so that they could write it and learn it uh, of course from the memorizers and he had actually as I said from the data I just, I, I just presented that he had presented the Quran to the living tradition of the Muslims and from there onwards it was transferred to the rest of the generations and in the last uh, topic uh, before we end this topic I have another something more to say in the next episode vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis uh, some of the collection episodes uh, which have been mentioned in uh, these territories. But once we do that, uh, the final topic of our uh, of this whole series would actually then focus on how this collected Quran was transferred uh, to the next generations. So uh, I would end my talk here and uh, before we move on to the next topic, as I said, I will introduce uh, some of the questions which do arise on this account of the Prophet, especially if we take up uh, Hadith narratives, although I have answered uh, those questions in detail when I was discussing uh, the Ahadith, the respective Ahadith, which mention various episodes of the collection of the Quran, but I am just going to briefly uh, answer my, uh, my response to those narratives and evaluate those narratives in a very in a nutshell way, and people who would like to uh, look them up in more detail can see the actual talks. But for those who would like to skip those talks and just want to know how I have criticized uh, those narratives, uh, the next episode, inshallah, will deal with them. Until then, Akulu Kalihaza, Vastafirullah, Ali, Walakum, Walisar al Muslimina, Wal Muslimat.